All right, so full disclosure before we get this started, we are going to do the brunch talk thing as soon as, you know, people get here and whatnot. But I kind of want to start it on time. Also, I'm going to eat bacon and eggs in front of you, and I don't care. Uh, yeah, it's that kind of a Sunday. I'm also going to transition over there so you can see my face. Hey, check that out. So, title of this is You Just Committed to Ohio State, right? Because, well, I always try to give it at least 8 to 10 minutes of just straight college football talk from me, while also not necessarily having a, a real expectation that you stick with the rest of this podcast, but that's cool. Look, I titled this You Just Committed to Ohio State because we saw that Jansen Dunn flipped his silent commit, which is a thing that I had not seen in this amount of time, like ever, because you see the eyes get tweeted out. You see, you know, people getting up just cool about it, right? And then Lincoln comes over the top with didn't have spring football, but hey, check this out. We still they're going to have a good time on days when we traditionally get commits. And then news comes out that Ohio State reached out. It's like, what you doing? And he's like, oh, oh okay. I didn't, I didn't know you guys really wanted me like that. Yeah, we want you like that. Well, now back back to where we were, right? With Steve Wiltfong flipping his crystal ball from Oklahoma to Ohio State. Now, if you feel like Ohio State is getting all the recruits that you want, that's because you're correct, <laughs> Because they're putting together the best recruiting class in the history of recruiting classes. Like, quite literally, you just take a look at the numbers. I've done this over the course of the week so much so that I have Ohio State fans going, are you joining the dark side? No, I'm not. I am very interested in recruiting and in college football. I'm also interested in this thing where Ohio State just seems to be recruiting in a way that I've never seen anybody recruit, particularly in a dead period. And that's what's most remarkable about this. Now, I also need to add in here... I was making jokes about Alabama, and then Alabama apparently watched the videos that I was making and got two more commitments in two days. So now they're up to three in the last two days. They picked up a good wide receiver, uh, to great wide receiver, depending on who you want to talk to. Yesterday, around about six o'clock, uh, Aji Hall is every bit of six foot three, two oh five, and is outstanding after the catch. Now, they need to find a quarterback because Drake May ends up flipping from Alabama to North Carolina. Didn't see that coming. But then again, did we see North Carolina coming at all? I don't think we did. I don't think any of us did. I think that Mac Brown just put a rope up around North Carolina and decided to keep all that great talent in state. And who knew that, one, Mac Brown had this kind of sway, and two, that Mac Brown could just show up at North Carolina and start out-recruiting Blue Bloods. And by Blue Bloods, I'm really talking about Blue Bloods in college football, right? And Blue Bloods in in recruiting. More than college football in recruiting, right? Because you look at LSU, they're not even the top 20. Clemson is doing Clemson stuff, which, you know, is what you expect. Notre Dame is also sitting there in the top five. Florida's been recruiting its butt off, but then again, Florida is the most talent-rich state in the union when we're talking about football. Georgia is going to be Georgia, because they don't even care anymore. They're just coming to get your recruits. But North Carolina, who is North Carolina in football, right? That's been the question all along. North Carolina was once the place where Mac Brown was, but that's where he got a Texas job, right? He got a Texas job, started recruiting Texas. When he had coordinators, he's always been good. So now he's got coordinators and he's recruiting. North Carolina, I expect to be good, not just this coming year, but next year. And this 21 class is going to be really interesting because the evaluation is going to be all over the board, man, because we don't have any regional camps for these kids to go to, and we probably don't have summer camps for the kids to go to. So kids that would normally use this opportunity to make the leap in the rankings are also having a really hard time just, you know, getting looks. I mean, they're having to send huddle film out to any number of places and any number of coaches. And because it's a dead period, they got to reach out first, right? And then they're not guaranteed to get a response back. All while you watch Ohio State just somehow be able to pull these kids out of thin air. Kids that I thought there was going to be a battle for all the way through the summer, like Tumise Adelier, like Travion Henderson, right? Like Evan Pryor. And now it could be Emeka Ubuka is headed that way, and JT Tuamala is headed that way. But if those two kids from the state of Washington don't end up at Washington, and they end at Ohio State, I think that most of college football recruiting fans are going to go insane. They are not going to know what to do about any of this, because all of a sudden, who had Ryan Day? out recruiting Urban Meyer. In what universe did you see that coming? That's like Nebula with the Infinity Gauntlet. It just it just ain't the way that the plot goes. And yet, if you look at the recruiting rankings, you see 
Kerry Coombs, you see Tony Alford, you see Larry Johnson Sr., my goodness, Al Washington, and on it goes, right? So whether it's the Zoom phone calls, maybe it's the beard that Ryan Day is growing out, or perhaps they're just better at this thing called recruiting through the internet than anybody gave them credit for. Because while we've been talking about Lincoln Riley probably securing three very good recruits. The fact of the matter is they're not even in the boat. And for all the folks that want to say it's a long road to recruiting and most of these kids from Ohio State are going to decommit, show me the kids that are committing elsewhere, right? I mean, we have data to show that commitments for the most part stick, right? So let's let's just go ahead and assume that you lose three from this Ohio State class. They're still going to be 50 points clear of anybody else. They're still going to have the best class in college football, and I think they're like a commit away from sewing that title up because they're sitting at like 290 points. Most years, it takes about 300 to 310 to win the recruiting national title, okay? They get close to 330 this year if they do this correctly because they're still the number one player out there who seems to be in Ohio State lane. They're still the number one wide receiver out there who seems to be in Ohio State lane to go along with two dominant running backs at four-star and five-star to go along with the best offensive guard in the country, in Donovan Jackson. And we could really talk about Jack Sawyer being the best defensive end in, in the country if you feel that kind of way, but maybe you feel like Corey Foreman deserves that title. You have to wait and see. I think this is really fascinating to, to think about and to look at from the standpoint of boosters as well, right? Because right now, you're going to have a really difficult time getting people to throw money at your program because of the state of the economy. We're not even through this pandemic yet, and we're already talking about people having to fold up shop and furloughs going everywhere all the time, and we've seen a record number of folks file for unemployment. Also, add to that, if you live in Texas, right, Oklahoma, Louisiana, places where oil is a big part of the economy, you're talking about record lows for barrels of oil. So that money, which is usually boom or bust, right, is very much in the bust aspect of things. So A&M ain't necessarily going to want to shell out for Jimbo Fisher if he does not have together the class that they think he should have, right? Might be actually closer to just folding up their arms and waiting on his contract to run out. And now they're going to look real silly with that 10-year, $75 million contract because they can't buy it out, right? You're also going to look at, I think, group of five squads that we thought might have the come up, like Appalachian State, like Boise State, like Memphis, who may not be able to function in the way that we've been accustomed to them functioning. Memphis winning or uh, getting to that Cotton Bowl after winning the Conference USA champ or Conference USA, the American Championship, might be the last time they do that for a while, right? So we're going to see a lot of programs just get lopped off, basically because of funding. So when Ohio State is able to put together this kind of class and this kind of an atmosphere, you got to believe that most people are going to buy into Ohio State that one weren't already bought into Ohio State, and two might have been holding back their money for something else entirely. Because what we do know is. People really want to win national championships, right? They'll, they'll, they'll shell out for national championships. They will not go broke, but they'll go close to it because they want their team to be that good. And I think we're really going to find out what people value, right? Like my alma mater, I can't wait to see what the University of Tulsa looks like after all of this because at one point it's the smallest Division A football team or football program in the country based on enrollment, right? It's a private university. It gets funding from the kids that go to university, not necessarily from the federal government. It doesn't have a whole lot of scholarships like to go around, right? So you really need to win if you're Philip Montgomery to try to get some of those folks to believe in what you're doing because nobody wants to support a loser, right? People want to give money to people that win. It's one of the reasons why unemployment doesn't work for some folks in certain economic and social atmospheres. It's because you don't want to support anybody that's on their butt, or so you think, right? You want to support somebody that you could see bootstrapping themselves. Thing is, not everybody got bootstraps to pull up, and that's how you're going to figure this out in college football, which is going to make Clemson even more remarkable, right? Because with Clemson being able to be Clemson for the past five years and put away a lot of this money we think and be able to pay Dabo Sweeney and pay Tony Elliott and pay Brent Venables, right? They also have data to show they're going to be in this thing when college football comes back, right? North Carolina, maybe somebody was thinking that it's time to get out of their football program or bring money back into the basketball program, but Roy Williams not only had a piss poor year, but Mac Brown looks like he's setting up to have a great next three years by these recruiting classes. I think that these recruiting rankings are going to have a lot to say about funding in the future is what I'm saying, right? You need to be busting your butt right now if you're a college football coach recruiting more than you ever have 
basically to ensure that you still have the same amount of money that you had last year for the next three years, right? Garrett Neusmeyer, I think, is an LSU lean, and, you know, we got 100% of Crystal Ball said he's headed that way, but Ed Orgeron needs to make sure that that kid gets in the boat sooner rather than later so you can show this stuff to the folks that give money to the program, right? Not to say that Louisiana is ever going to fold their football team. That just ain't what it's going to be. But talking about renovations, talk about how much money you want to put into the locker rooms, how much money you want to put into strength and conditioning facilities, how much money you put in the recruiting budget, all of this affects right now based entirely on what you're able to do. And what you're able to do right now is recruit. You can't even guarantee that you're going to play college football in 2020. You can't. You can guarantee putting together a top five recruiting class because even in a dead period, you can recruit and they are recruiting and you're seeing people flex their digital muscle and you're seeing people uh, really dig deep into their digital content creator well, right? I think folks like Zach Heffley at Oklahoma are proving their worth every single day just with the content that they're able to produce and the way that they're able to look make the university look good on the Twitters, right? We saw Lincoln Riley walking through his shoes the uh, just yesterday, right? Doing that sort of stuff and being able to flip bad video into something that's worthwhile is a skill I possess and a skill that Heffley possesses. But now we're finding out Nick Saban not having a Snapchat account, just getting an Instagram account, all these things coming back to bite him, right? Just getting your email, yeah, that's a problem. You know how many people I just have an email for stuff? Like, how do you not have an email account? Oh, that's right. You don't involve yourself in, well, subscription models for this, subscription models for that, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Kick. Uh, what else we got in here? What am I on? Xbox, PS4, uh, Nintendo Switch, all these ways of which you could use to communicate with the kids. Just doesn't do it. All right. Now, let's do the other thing. Is everybody in here? Because there's 233 people here. I'm talking to you, brunch crew. Katie, Ron, Tyler. Tyler's here. Okay. Hey, Tyler. Tyler, you want to switch subject entirely? Is there anything you want to talk about that I just rambled on? Uh, I got nothing. Oh. I do see a couple of uh, mute buttons that are on uh, others. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see. Are we going to uh, get using college football? All right, let me let me give get give me your uneducated guess here, uh, Tyler. Are we going to see college football this year? Uh I'm going to go with we shouldn't see college football mm. uh, this year. Uh, I unfortunately think that we we stand a decent chance of seeing it. But uh, health and wise, we shouldn't. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's going to go uh, All this is not going to go away fast enough because uh, too many people aren't uh, helping make it happen. Yeah. Do you see the, the photos out of Nashville? Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it's like, you know, we have uh, the governor of Florida doing his best Florida man impression. Uh, he couldn't with even put on the mask correctly. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, and then the, the protests, the protests for uh, against health and safety is, is effectively what they are. Oh, man. Uh, the, the extremely public protests against health and safety. Um, we had and a then a lot of places like here we have, you know, the two major cities of Oklahoma have a, a shelter in place order, but not the entire state uh, as of right now. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if we're going to get enough help to actually have it be adequately safe to see football, but that might not stop us. I don't think it should happen. Or, I don't know, football in the spring, everybody? Yes. What do you think? No, no. Hey, look, that is the last resort, right? Because... What we do have a consensus on is we will see football in the calendar year, right? That's what we have a consensus on. It's where in the calendar year, right? Because nobody wants to lose these games because particularly with, with college football, the f September schedule is front-loaded with the non-conference games, right? The games that everybody wants to see across the country, like Ohio State and Oregon and whatnot, for, for starters. And the idea that you would shorten the season is a non-starter for a lot of people because those ticket sales and that television money – figures into every game because you only got 12 regular season games, right? And if you shorten that to nine or even eight, that's a quarter of your revenue down the drain. And when you talk about the Big Ten, for instance, $759 million they brought in in 2018. 
they paid out $54 million to each of the longest standing member schools, of which there were 12, right? The SEC had $44 million that they gave out on average last year. and But that's for every game. That's for 12 games, right? So if you have to mess with the broadcast schedule in the spring to get this done, I think everybody's going to be on board for that because the television networks want to get their money because they want to be able to sell everything to advertisers. College football folks want to get their money because this is the only way that you make the NCAA run. I mean, talk about the college football playoff. It's worth $600 million annually. For perspective, March Madness is worth $800 million annually, right? And then if you expand the playoff field to 8, 12, 16, that's more money and a a larger pie. And this is really interesting because not only is everybody losing money, everybody's losing money. I mean, Adam Silver comes out and says, our revenue is at zero right now. That's not good. Like, we owe people. <laughs> they, we owe yeah, lots of people. Than optimal. Yeah. yeah. It's less than optimal to have a revenue of zero. It's, it's really not preferred. Yeah. And I find that to be, I thought that was fascinating for him to just admit, right? But I also, when doing the math, like, what are you going to say? What, what, what do you have yeah, to sell? I, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, otherwise, if, you're, if you try to, if you try to fuzz it and everybody's like, really, where, where are you maybe getting anything from? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's too easy to, to, to poke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like football in the spring would be an interesting uh, alternative. Uh, uh, you know, I would prefer everybody just go ahead and plan for and hold off till the spring. Just, you know, put everything in place right now. We have some time to, you know, get that uh, or, you know, get that organized and stuff like that. And just make it official, like play it safe. Boom. Spring. We have it all planned out. You know, we no last minute, you know, flipping it from one to the other, just straight up, boom, here it is, springtime. We're not going to, we're just going to do it in the spring. And everybody uh, buckle down, uh, get into a cave, whatever you need to do, uh, and then and then come out uh, after Christmas. I kind of, I want to serve up Mr. Scrunchy to the group. So anybody that wants to take this one on, please feel free. Um don't think people over 65 are playing college football. Your thoughts. Who's watching football? I mean, I feel like that's a, an incredibly ageist uh, opinion to throw out there. You know, every four or five years or so, you see some dude that decided to go back and get his bachelor's at age 70. So, you know what? I was a varsity player, but World War II happened. So, I got to go out there and show these young whippersnappers what, you know, what I can do. I can prove it to myself. So, like, I mean. I mean, there's a few out there. Just you got to search for it. And, so, and yeah, also, people like you know, decide to sign up for it, like the community college team. So, who is the oldest player in the NFL, or generally speaking? Uh, I think it's actually Tom Brady right now. It used to be Morton Anderson, but Tom Brady is going to be turn 43 in uh, August. But more than that, to the to the to Mr. Scrunchy, who do you think coaches college football? Those guys are all over 65, save like seven. <laughs> like all of those guys in are in the mind. target are in the target rich environment. <laughs> it's like I'm what? just gonna also go ahead and say uh young people die. Just just saying that. <laughs> That's right, young folks. You know, young people. <laughs> That's right, young folks. Can knock you down a peg. Yeah. No, I go like who says this? See, I, like I, I when it comes to like the college football coming back, it, it would either have to be coming back as soon as possible for any respect to university or it had to come back you know, later date when everybody's good, because let's say you have a, a breakout in Pennsylvania. So it's like, all right, all the kids in, in at Penn state are out, out, are out. So you just mark that as L you just skip that game or, uh, because you are, you have to think of the, like these, these student athletes are, are students and they're, you know, subject to the rules of the university. So if the university says, sorry, school's not open. Um, you, you that, right. that team's not playing. Even if say like Michigan and Ohio State say like uh, Michigan says we're playing football and Ohio State says class is not in session, you you still go forward if you are you know got those green lights. Well, if enough people are giving the green lights, it's it's interesting that you say that because Bob Bowlesby, who's the commissioner of the Big Twelve, flat out told Mike Pence, "We're not playing if there are no students on campus because our athletes are students." Gauntlet. Right there, thrown I mean, down. That, I mean, that tracks. Uh, it, right. it, no, it, here's the thing. If you want to start, if you want to uh, bring uh, club sports to the forefront, please be my guest. 
But we, you, you we, can't wait, say, like, we have eat. scabs for college football? <laughs> <laughs> yes! No, actually, Give actually, it to me! I, no, I suggest everybody move to Tabletop Simulator and play Tabletop Simulator versions of... Uh, we're doing that already. Of these football games. We're already, nationally, we're, uh, we're already doing that. All right. Well, no, that that was the... Uh, uh, that was racing, wasn't it? No, no, no. We have simulations going on, right? Like, BR Betting puts on a simulated college football game via Madden. And then we had Reddit last night that had UCF versus Alabama in a simulated college football game. Like, we're already Wait, so, there. I mean, so all the players play themselves on the field? No, actually. Ah, uh, no. Dang it. No. See, no, that's what I want. It's 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 the sticks <laughs> playing. It's it's CPU versus CPU. You, uh, you know how this works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We just left, we left the joysticks in the middle, <laughs> and that's how we're 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 amusing ourselves. Though I have really thought about turning on the PS4, taping the game, and then me just call the game just to see how that feels. Ooh. Right, yeah, okay. Just see how it feels. <laughs> I don't know. It, it it's it's interesting. Listen, as long as it's mascots versus mascots, that's all. That's all that I ask. Ah, oh, you and the mascot mode. <laughs> they shouldn't have put it in the game if they didn't want me to like it. Man, I, I okay. I I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Leave that one alone. No, I I think it's it's fascinating to to talk about these things, but I also I keep wanting to say it's April. But that's because I I want to be the glass half empty or half full dude instead of the glass is broken. Is that is that unfair? Wait, which April? You're talking about? No, right uh, now is right now is April, and we're talking about stuff that could not begin at all until August. But you know, that's my glass half full take uh, as opposed to the glass is broken. True. Just man, August isn't that far away. I, that's why I was asking. <laughs> is it is it unfair? <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's what, it's what Ron said. Uh, you know, you get a, it's going to end up being a game of whack-a-mole. It's like, well, you know, that, that school can't do anything now. Uh, oop, that school can't do anything now. Uh, it's like, that's not a real season. Hmm. Uh, we stand a better chance of having like a, a normal season. It still might happen. We have stand a better chance of having a normal season hmm. if it just gets pushed off to, uh, first part of 2021. Uh, otherwise it's four months, uh, we will you will just get the whack a mole. It's like, hey, yeah, sorry. Uh, oh, you can't play today. It's See, like, I don't, I don't, oh, 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 you takes an L. Uh, right. It's like, Oop. I don't <laughs> mind have it not having a, like, you don't need to give me a normal season. Do whatever minor league gimmick that you need to to, to put revenue <laughs> on the table. And, and at this point, we'll watch it as long as it's not the, as long as it's not horse. Like we're gonna be there to to watch a game, especially if the game is the sport we know and love. I don't care how much the 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 schedule works out. I just need to see it happen. Hmm. So if you're if you're school, so I'm assuming that you have you have this uh, an issue with uh, your revenue stream, uh, yeah. However, you can get it out there. It doesn't matter. You you have a four team round robin. What's it? Just pretty much uh, uh, Clemson playing the Washington Generals the entire time. I don't care. Go, do it. You you need to play the sport, and then and just, then just a year from then it can go back to you know to just, just finger don't kill quotes normal. Just don't kill people doing it. Yeah, just don't kill people doing it. <sighs> Yikes! Um, didn't didn't know that that was the bar, but you know, all right, that's that's <laughs> that's, that's yikes. All right. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just. Fine. I, I mean, I guess maybe it's a little harsh. Maybe we should lighten that up. Okay, only kill a few people. Uh, we we got another. You cannot live in fear. Let them play, dude. In here. Uh, it's not in fear, man. It's I love not in fear. I love being able to serve these up to you. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. in pure pure comfort and knowledge uh, that people die from it, and uh, people over profit. <laughs> Oh my God, some of these. Okay, like, all right, so to, to kind of rope this all together. Is there like a risk manager out there listening to us that's like, don't live in fear? Who are these people? Dana White. Oh. Dana White. I gotta, I gotta avoid all uh, these lawsuits, dog. Da Dan Dana White had to get calls from Jimmy Pitaro and Bob Iger to be like, no. <laughs> Dana was gonna do it. Also, they sent out 18 trademarks for Fight Island. True story. 
they trademarked Fight Island. Cowtown Customs, that's a lie. Todd B., if they have good tests, absolutely, but people are asymptomatic. I'm just, I'm going to just call everybody out on chat. Is this what it, this bunch is going to be? I, I think so, because I'm, I'm, know. I'm, I'm, here, right. I'm here for it, because... Sweet. I'm just, I'm saying, like, I think that this particular group here is, is in the camp of COVID-19 is not a ruse, so mm. we treat it as such. Yeah, yeah. Well... All right, let me let me let me throw this all in a pot because I, I really want to get y'all's opinions on these things. Um, so I got beef with Clay Travis for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is that he has flipped his podcast into an anti-vaxxer podcast and it's doing gangbuster numbers by saying lies flat out and not apologizing for it. Then throw into this for me, I'm watching Global Citizens last night and I'm irate. I'm very upset because I, I work very hard to, to basically have this kind of a thing just function, right? And watching John Legend with his AirPods on or watching Lizzo not singing to the blue mic that I'm pretty sure was not hooked up, I have feelings about that. But again, I have feelings about that because I, I, I do this. I don't think anybody else really cared. And I guess that's kind of the, the question that I wanted to ask. Do people, one, care about facts, and two, do they care about sound and technology? I mean, oh, well, some people do, uh, particularly when it comes to sound and technology. Hmm. Um, I think there's a whole generation of people that are used to so much of the audio that they consume just coming through uh, the, the, the phone microphone. Uh, as opposed to, as for facts, I don't know, I feel like we figured this out like four years ago. To, to crib from Jesus and Mero, like facts don't matter. Mm. Yeah, only the, only the facts that support your uh, only the facts that support your personal beliefs, which is may, a trend, which may not or, be facts at all. Yeah, yeah, facts to me, yeah, I looked them up, I read them, <laughs> I sent you a link. Breaking They're the true, like, breaking the only rule of this podcast by doing research. Oh yeah, and I'm sorry. I've had the I've had my facts tab up this entire time. Excuse me. I let me close that. No. Uh, I mean, in regards to facts, I guess it's all a question of, like, I mean, kind of like Tyler was saying, um, the facts that support what you believe. I guess it's a question of like where do your sort of ethical boundaries lie. And like, what are you willing to accept to maintain, you know, the way of life that you want or that you think that you want, or you've been, you know, I don't know. I mean, I get philosophical if I go on too long. So no, walk that out. Yeah, please. Uh, like this. Cause like we got a time limit or something. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Talk about nice. a thing that doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> what time it is. Right. <laughs> well, just just kind of going back as an example, you know, the people who are saying like quote unquote live without fear. I mean, they they want to obviously get back to a life that they are comfortable with and you know, where they're I guess quote unquote safe. Um, and that's butting up against and what, you know kind of reality to a certain extent, I guess. Um, and that's probably not a great place to be mentally, I guess is the right word. Mm. Mm. I as, think the, sorry, Kate. I, don't know. I was going to say, I just see this as a basic question of manners. I see a lot of people volunteering other people. Like if people want to get back out there, have at it, get with a bunch of people who are like you Get yourselves out of the general mix, do what you want to do, and then see what happens if you don't believe what's going on. But don't put other people on the hook for your choices. Well, but that does put other people on the hook. Because if they get sick, then you're suddenly you're a burden on the healthcare system and you're putting other people at risk because you're in the hospital and workers that otherwise would not have to treat you are now exposed to you. So no matter what, you're putting other people at risk. Oh, all of that is true, and I believe all of that. I'm just saying I think that there are levels here, and I don't see people who are volunteering other people even thinking about those levels at all. Like there's a, a bare minimum here that is still unacceptable that I still don't see people rising to meet. 
No, I, I, I agree with that, and I try to turn it into a joke uh, most of the time. So we've had a we had a, a, a slate of people just using that that N word incorrectly and wrong, yeah. which is oh which, which is you know anyway. The point, the way that I have started talking about this is people like I get predictably people saying, "Hey, man, what Kyle Larson said wasn't to you and doesn't actually affect you." And I don't understand why he can't just say it. To which I said, "Okay, you say it. You let me know how that works out. You you just you just say it. Matter of fact, say it to somebody that looks like me to their face. You tell me how that works." I need people to stop guarding the apology rim like they're Matumbo. Oh man! And by the way, like we'll go, we'll clap for you when you get back. Like that was the okay. What what really made me upset was it the Kyle Larson said it wasn't even his BS apology. It's that once he got fired, the owner of the team was like, he's going to come back. He might even be able to come back with us. We, we you know, he made, a, he made a mistake. Like he kicked somebody in the shin on accident. <laughs> oh, I got another uh, call out. Hey, Michael Levesque, uh, has the flu killed more people uh, than the coronavirus this month? This year? That still bothers me because it's still apples and oranges. I know. Yeah, that's also a thing. But uh, also, also, it's worthless to say that. But also, <laughs> get out of here with that. Well, welcome to the RGN okay, back, Show podcast. Uh, back to casual where racism. You will Sorry. get dunked on for saying the wrong stuff in the chat. I love this. I love this. We need to do this all the time. I mean, it's just ignorant. It's like... If you still think this is like the flu, then explain to me why the country doesn't shut down every single year over the flu. Like, have you not, do you, do you know any healthcare workers? Have you talked to anyone who's on the front lines? Because I got an email from my cousin who's up in the Bronx right now, working at a hospital. Let me tell you, it's some traumatizing stuff. It's a good feature in the yeah. social world. I, yeah, does, I mean, it kind of goes back to almost um, the rural versus, you know, city you know, sort of struggle, you know, whereas like people in more rural communities aren't seeing as much of that, like sort of thing that talking about, well, they're seeing it definitely, but um, they're not seeing, you know, New York being this, you know, big absolute war zone for healthcare workers and that sort of thing. And since they can't see it, you know, in their sort of day-to-day -day lives and, you know, there's a certain safety that comes with the sort of distance from a lot of people, they think. That, oh, yeah, this isn't going to happen. This isn't real. And that kind of dissidence. Yeah, no, I... I seeing... Go ahead, Noah. I was going to say, I'm just seeing a lot of fear and emotion and people trying to pretend that those are re like forms of reason and rationality. I just think everybody needs to take a breath. And if you're trying to rush to getting things how they were before, just take a minute, check in with yourself and ask, what is actually driving this? And it's okay if it's coming from a place that doesn't feel good, but ask who might be hurt by this instead of asking, how can I get what I want out of this? Uh, I wrote a book with this at the middle of it. And what I found is people don't care, Noam. They don't know them. They don't care. It's just like, okay, an example here. Uh, Robert Lane, who's been basically patronizing this channel from jump. Uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of school. He, he drives for a living, right? He is an essential worker and he's telling people stay at home. I'm out here because I have to be. And really some of the things that you depend on, notably these masks or groceries, right? To use two things that people are just shopping for are things he needs to provide. But also, it ain't his his eyes are showing him things that show people don't care. Just like I mean, we can we can glom what you just said over into race. We can glom it over into gender. We can glom it over into political debates. People don't care. People care about themselves. It, you know, like asking people to be investigate uh, investigatory about that. I found doesn't work. Superficial, vapid. Do you? D. Williams had that uh, a good call out on the chat. If it's not in their face, then it's fake news or just being overly exaggerated. Hmm. 
as a as, as a as a view if it's if it's not in front of them uh easily dismissed i'm going to expand that to say even if it is in front of you if it's inconvenient mm. it gets easily dismissed. Ah, ah. <laughs> good point no man i ugh. Uh, I don't I don't mind people that are, you know, self-interested, you know, but make sure you put that up front. But if your self-interest to saying, you know, if I don't work, I don't eat also might put somebody into mortal danger. I think I'm, you might need to work on your particular brand of solipsism. <laughs> and if, with all the time that we have right now, I, I think that uh, uh, you have a- ample opportunity to do that. I love how that word is entering everyday lexicon now. Yo, I listen to Kanye. I talk. I say solipsism every day. Yeah, you got on a red hat. Hold on, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? What does what mean? Solipsism. That word. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's it's. Oh my! It's my. It was one of my favorites for a while. Of the uh, you exist in the universe, but everybody else is suspect. Was a very short. Uh, uh, a very short um, synopsis. Yeah, b- basically only I exist. Exactly. That's what it is. Um, Everything else is a simulation. I am the only real thing. Everything ex- exists either to please me or to vex me. Um, I am the I'm the OC, the, the main character, the protagonist of the universe. Right. Which is also... Uh, you know, it, it borders on narcissism, but narcissism at the very least uh, is a belief that other people exist. You're just superior, right? As opposed to nobody else exists. I only exist. I'm not sure which is worse, by the way. The more that I, I dig into this, for, uh, and I would love to get your opinion on this, Noam, uh, having studied philosophy. Because as I dig into it, the things kind of, they're braided together depending on what the time and circumstance is. Yeah. Uh, what about it? Are you are you curious about my opinion about? So, this question of which is worse <laughs> on a scale of lunatic to crazy, which is worse to be, a solipsist or narcissist? Uh, I don't know how I feel about that dichotomy. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like you know you could be both. Or you could, uh, you could kind of, you know, inhabit it on a spectrum, maybe, and swing, swing back and forth between different combinations of them, mm. and maybe with some other stuff in the mix. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I feel like both things are misunderstood, and I think that, I mean, if I if I'm just gonna boil down what I got out of philosophy and what I get out of it, mm. how it informs how I think about it, it's just just being an observer of things which you don't you're not always as good at it as you want to be i feel like i learned some humility out of it and just like learning some skills for observing and you're never you're never as good at it as you want to be you don't you don't get to see that you observe it without solipsism or narcissism you know because you're still stuck in it too right it's just I just think about philosophy as tools for slowly lifting your leg out of the quicksand a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that I have a clear opinion about it. I feel like we all fall into traps sometimes. Question is, who's going to get hurt? And what are you doing about it? I, I think that that's as specific of an opinion as I can give you. Like I'm okay. I'm okay with not having a clear take here. Obviously, both of those things are negative things. I think we need to cut people slack for, you know, when we fall into harmful behaviors and then also like repeating them. What can you do to to reduce that harm? I think that that's about as much as I can, I can fall into that. Yeah, and a moment of silence for the uh, for the camera. Working hard. Hey, man. Streaming for an hour is is oh it's it yeah. it's a champion it's okay tough. and it's it's either let it cool down or it will cool down itself. 
<laughs> yes. So it would do it in a way that you don't like. Uh, kind of on this. Uh, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say <laughs> thank you to Mighty Plays for complimenting the screensaver. Laurel made that, so when she joins again, be sure to tell her you like screensaver. Go ahead, Kate. Oh, I was just gonna say I'm um, kind of on this note. I've found it very interesting. I've seen a lot of online petitions circulating to bring certain things back in certain capacities. Um, like for instance, um, a lot of my friends have been sharing, um, like, oh, bring back cosmetology as an essential thing because, you know, people are wanting to get their hair done and their nails done. <laughs> it's, it's mostly what that's about. I've also seen like bring back the gyms sort of petition circulating to let people in gyms. Um, so, I don't know. Just found it kind of interesting uh, that they had, yeah. Because apparently getting your nails done is important in the, uh, the situation. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, the way that I'm looking at my hands right now is absolutely an essential business. Uh, anybody who's <laughs> come take care of my my hands and feet, I will. Um, I guess I'll do whatever I can to like I'll wrap myself in a bubble except for my hands and feet, and I'll show up. Bring a COVID test. Uh, bring two go COVID tests and uh, get it done. Right. I mean, we're talking about getting ready for summer, and I am trust me, I'm not ready. Uh, but I thought summer was kind of canceled, so. Uh, hey, it, it's gonna be hot regardless. All right, I, I don't give a damn what what the, what the COVID is doing, what the Rona doing. It's gonna be hot, right? And nothing's gonna stop this hot boy summer. And I gotta I gotta get my feet right. I for one am uh am looking forward to that because you know what I found is I eat I've been eating well and you know I have been doing my push ups. And, and and eating these these uh, paleo meals that Ron sent me recipes for, I become much better at grocery shopping, which is to say I go like once a month. Like I don't have to go again until like May fifth. Uh, there's some there's some stuff that I am willing into existence. Oh, that was where I was leading with this. I wanted to get what what your favorite piece of pop culture, ephemera or uh, media that you have consumed this week, because I'm. 350 pages into the third book in the border trilogy called the border by Don Winslow. And uh, without getting too inside baseball, Katie, the omniscient narrator is pissing me off, particularly as it pertains to uh, drugs and cartel culture. I just, I guess I wanted to go pulpy and I went all the way pulpy. And now I'm, am I the same person is what I'm asking myself because I remember loving these first two books, but I read these first two books in like 2012 and 2014. And this other one is like 700 pages. It's one of these two big to fails. It's like bigger than the Goblet of Fire. And I can't say it's the favorite thing. Go ahead. Who was talking? Okay. Well, um, uh, so if if you were reading this, like I, you know, I I enjoy a good omniscient third person uh, narrator every now and then. Like if you were to read this voice into uh, the dude that uh, did uh, Dukes of Hazard, was it Waylon Jennings? If you have the Waylon Jennings mm. narrator in your head, would that make it any better? No, mm. no. You it, anytime you switch perspectives and then you switch tenses in the middle of a paragraph. I'm I'm going to lose it. I don't care if you got a, a small little white space break. It's a sin that I was never allowed to commit. And I think that's the reason why I really hate it. It's because, again, it's one of these things that if I just brought it into workshop, I get eviscerated and told I don't know what I'm doing. Were, and I have no sense of crap. Well, I was about to say, were, were, you, were you gutted uh, for a good reason? Or is it like, oh, these people don't know what they're doing. I gotta let me got to let me do it. Uh, it goes back to that thing about, you know, I'm good at this. This person that I expected to be good at this is not good at this. It's 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 a technical thing. And I think that with more discipline, you could have wrote in a third person. There's no reason for an omniscient narrator. None. 
I should take that back because I talk in absolutes a lot. There's probably a reason for an omniscient narrator, but I've yet to see a good but, one. But but not for this story. Yeah, 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 not I, for this narrative. Well, okay. So tell me what 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 needs an omniscient narrator? Oh, that's such a hard that's, that's a hard question for me because you could throw an omniscient narrator uh, narrator into anything. It depends on what the story is. Yes, but did you need an omniscient narrator? And could you have been much more surgical with the first person or third person? Or even the royal we. Because then we came to end is written in the royal we. And I, I, I enjoyed that. But that was also about the end of the book. That wasn't about. That wasn't about needing to use it except for the end of the book. And if you don't use it all the way through, the end of the book doesn't make any sense. It's kind of like jazz. Y'all ready? Mm -hmm. They're. People read jazz. Jazz. Anyway, so to your question, are you, do you, I mean, do you want do you want to lead that off of the the cool things that you consumed this week? Was it just the book? Uh, no, the cool thing I consumed this week was North Mythology by Neil Gaiman. It uh, it kept my interest over the over the top of Breath of the Wild, which I I I really need to start playing today. I was about to say. Have yeah. you played it at all? I, I picked it up and I didn't leave the dungeon. <laughs> like I watched the I watched the animation. I did find a um show, RJ, that you and I need to watch um and talk about. It's a uh, sports conspiracy show. Sports conspiracy? Yep. Like betting? No. Like um it's a show where these two guys explore uh uh, sports conspiracies from you know history like the like the like the black Sox and maybe the the new york knicks drafting patrick ewan type things or is there something even deeper yeah. than that i mean and like supernatural thing like conspiracy you know like there's a whole different conspiracies uh g ghost ship type stuff i'm yep. on board yep okay which is why it caught my interest because right. you know I love a good conspiracy. Well, I Did mean, you know I don't know if you know, but I got this time where I'm spending a lot of time at home, and you know. But I say I'm I'm trying to learn why the Bulls won six championships in the '90s was it because of ghosts. I believe it. Aliens, I believe it. The alignment of the planets. Well, you guys know that anyone winning any sport is a complete hoax, right? I mean. I, I believe it in like the all of it it's is all a by construct. design and it's all a yeah it's all a construct and they pick who's going to win every year um in order to make the most money and you know all of it means nothing <laughs> so, so sports so don't have matter have any, mm -hmm. have any of you heard any uh new music this week yes yes what did you listen to uh, the new tech nine. A heavy metal cover of, of a uh, dance song that I've never heard before. Yeah. yeah. By who? Uh, the cover was by uh, Leo and Frog Leap Studios for Dance Monkey. Uh, and now I'm going to have to look up the original artist because, like I said, I'd never heard the original song. I have been jamming on the uh, the new Thundercat album. It is much and it's a much easier listen to a lot of the past album it's not as 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 jazzy as the as a lot of earlier thundercat stuff but it's really good i recommend uh listening to dragon ball do rag on repeat it's real good thundercat's a bass player right yep dragon surely is yeah. i watched that's awesome i love it, I love it when I, I was just gonna say i love it when bass players are like the front people of projects i think that that's a really cool thing when it happens yeah no it's, it's really i i think it definitely brings a different uh feel to a lot of you know your popular music whenever once again yeah so you're basically also the songwriter so all of this is written around you know him having his hand on their instrument i love it like prime oh yeah I, I watched a review of this by uh uh the needle drop yeah I remember this. 
Yeah, I remember this. And RJ, what were you going to say that you heard this week? Interfere. It's the new Tech Nine album. Ah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. The album have a bell cow song? Uh, yeah, I, I hesitate to, to actually throw that one into the mix just yet. Okay. Because I'm not sure, right? It's a, it's a, it's a Tech Nine album and it's cryptic as all hell, which is what I'm here for. Um, but I don't know. Like, I mean, you could go with Drink Champs, but that's that's because you also like Caribou Lou and KCT. So, like, that's why I say I'm just not, I don't know yet. Because I like Outdone, but I don't know yet. I'm going to have to listen to it at least three more times before I can actually give you a definitive answer. Because, like, I got answers for every other album, but also it took me some while to get there. Uh, it took me a while to get there as well. Especially when he brings in collabs, right? Because, like, Chris Calico works with him because... I mean, they've basically been doing the same thing for 30 years. But when he tried to bring in Kendrick Lamar, I was like, okay, I don't know if this is going to work. And when he was doing this thing with Logic, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. And, and I appreciate that he's trying to get as many people involved with him as possible. But I also am like, yo, man, you, 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 you better when you're telling the stories. Because it also fits with the, uh, the mood of the song. Whereas you can always hell when somebody is really trying to just do a tech nine cover of a tech nine song as opposed to do them in a tech nine song does that make sense yeah okay all right well i'm also a tech nine enthusiast so that's i mean i, I figured out a way to put tech nine on terrestrial radio that, that was a lot of songs i was to i think to have a, a really negative view of when artists had weight but over time, my opinion on that has changed. Uh, and I think that, I mean, I haven't heard this album, but maybe it just has something to do with uh, the current situation that we're all in. Mm. But in a lot of ways, it feels a little bit like, uh, you know, I've got this, I've got this thing. Let me take you into it. And that feels really comforting right now when you see people do that, because I think that in a lot of ways, that's very ref a reflective attitude of the moment, which isn't to say at all that it has anything to do with this, right? But but I feel like in a lot of ways, some people have been ahead of the curve on that. Uh, and I think I respect that a lot more than I used to. Hmm. I, I definitely, like whenever I was a younger man growing up, I, I couldn't, I loved whenever I saw it. I was, I was big in like mixtape radio. So or was it mixtape radio, mixtape albums that would, that would come out. And so he had like eight people on a track, like I'm in heaven. And then I became a hipster for a hot second. And like the, the, uh, J Cole went platinum twice with, with no, with no guest stars, with no features. I'm like, you know, that, that's, that's great. But, I, I don't necessarily think that I need to get into or enjoy music more because of the uh, the the like the artist seclusion, right? I don't I don't necessarily need you to prove a point. I just want you to make music that I like. And so now I'm back again. It's like, hey, uh, I don't need an album. Drop a single. I don't care. Uh, mm -hmm. do, do, uh, drop a an, an an EP at midnight with just four songs. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do that every two weeks. I mean, not say I'm demanding it, but like. So you're, you <laughs> you subscribe to the BB No Money model. Our new music. Innate aspect of, of an ask of, of an album. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, no, no. I mean, so like you, you've, you've grown and you've evolved. How do you feel about music that has features or guest stars or a lot of people producing it? All right, feel free to dunk on me for this because um, I feel like, feel like this is a bow wow voice of our generation take, but I'm going to throw it in there anyway. Drake changed the way that I view features now. Okay. Like straight up and down because it used to be like a Drake song. The joke is, you know, you let Drake on your song. It's now Drake's song, you know, or when Future refused to do it, it was actually one of the, the best songs that I've heard this year. You know, good life is really good because both of those dudes get to be who they are and then pass it off. And Future got what he wanted, which is to finish the song and to have the song, right? And Drake got what he wanted, which is a Drake mood song. 
and they just like sickle mode, like they just straight up said, Travis Scott, we just go cut this part out entirely and we're going to make this a Drake song in the middle and we'll bring you back. And I, you know, like I was going, you could do that because, you know, on, on paper, of course you could do that. But Drake is able to make it work. Now, somebody else has probably done it before, right? Because I'm not, I'm not a music head like so many other people. I deal, I deal in sports. But when you ask me about features, I used to think a feature was somebody showing up for a verse in your song trying to do their best impersonation of you, right? Yeah, very, yeah, very much looked okay. like a contractual obligation. Right, right. And Drake just said, I'm going to do me in your song. Is that cool? And pe enough people have said, yes, is, is cool. And so I really want to see that flexed out because, you know, there's a part of me that would like to see an Ariana Grande Drake mashup. I, I would be here for that. Uh, but I'm also I'm also me and I'm, I'm much more of a uh, 106.9 K hits kind of dude than I am, uh, you know, deep into the well of mixtapes. I'm the commercial person at the table. I, I think that um, I think these things usually start through business decisions. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting how people can use that as a point of departure rather than like something to be completed, right? Like, all right, you're going to do a verse on this. You're going to get paid this much money to do that. When people can run with it and make something really new as opposed to just, you know, like the same thing plus an extra artist or something. Like, I feel like there's something really special about that. And that's in a lot of ways, a, like a pretty old thing. You see it in like a lot of different, in a lot of different musical styles too, right? Like what about that moment where Johnny Cash and Shel Silverstein got together and did a boy named Sue? Like who's featured on that? Like who is the feature, right? As opposed to just like this new thing that is ju that just comes up from both of them doing that thing together or like on the Deftones album uh white pony where they uh they bring in Maynard James Keenan from Tool <laughs> as a feature it's like okay but the moment that i hear Maynard James Keenan's voice everything is a tool song mm. you know just for that moment mm. obviously you know on the business side of it it isn't it's a deftones album it's a deftones song you got, you know, the guy from Tool on there for a moment. Then you go to like, I don't know, the Kendrick album, Damn, right? The first, uh, the first hip hop album to get a Pulitzer Prize in music. And, you know, but then you go and you look at the, at the credit sheet for every song and you realize, well, it's the album that got the prize and it's the album that really means something. And obviously, you know, Kendrick created this community around this album and we celebrate it as a Kendrick album, but it goes into all the weird places that it does because of all the people that are involved. Mm. You know, it's obviously to anyone who listens to Kendrick, like it's so different from to pimp a butterfly, which is almost to me just like a straight up, uh, blended jazz hip hop live album in some ways. Like it has that feel to me, um, like cap and jazz or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, yeah, so you can look at it at all these different ways, and I feel like every almost every time it takes on a life of its own, when it takes on a life of its own, I feel like that's when it really uh, develops the, the value that you can't really put a dollar sign on. I mean, obviously you can, but that's when you get, that's when things get really deep for people, I think, in a way that they probably don't want to put that, that dollar sign on. Yeah. That, I mean that that's how I feel about uh I mean I come with this from a, a dude that grew up listening to hip hop. That like that's that's how a lot of old heads interact with music in that it's the album that's good. I you know they they don't I mean I can't, for, if you're like me occasionally like the the music video may, pops up every now and then but it's basically the album is the thing that drives our nostalgia as opposed to something like right now which is the the the, like the the video hit right mm. it's the like are they saying like there's there's two different songs that are happening here right now like a, like that future and drake album which to be to be to be um, to be very honest every drake and future collabo is like a thousand white 
dwarves in my bloodstream. Like it's, it's really good to me. But every time that one of them says something and the other one says something, it's two different songs. Mm -hmm. And they're generally just made to be consumed on the internet or in like music video form. Uh, as opposed to like, if you were listening to like uh, an old Nas album or, uh, you know, some old Rockefeller Beanie Seek jam. It's it's not made to be singled out, so to speak. No, I buy that. that that concludes my my TED talk on music. <laughs> Do you know that Beastie Boys album, Paul's Boutique? Yep. Because that is a straight up collaboration album, right? It's them, but right, it's produced by the Dust Brothers which I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know, and probably maybe a lot of Dust Brothers fans don't know that. But that is like the strangest, most virtuosic Beastie Boys album because I think that each side got together, did their thing. And so it's kind of like the best of both worlds. And and it's the sum is definitely better. It's be definitely better than the sum of its parts. Um, it's my favorite Beastie Boys album. Like it, it really stands out compared to some of the other ones because the other one, a lot of the other ones are so pared down um, and polished. And that hits me almost more like, I don't know, just almost like a, like a really well-crafted, really well-chiseled statue. Mm -hmm. Almost. Um, and I'm the most interested when that sort of thing happens. That doesn't mean that that album is better than other things. I mean, I think that it, you listen to it and you go, I can't hear anything about this that I think should be different. Call, that a, call that a masterpiece? Yeah. I mean, maybe other people would disagree. Okay. And obviously for, for people who, uh, people who look for like, you know, those, I don't know. My favorite, my favorite genre of any artist is, uh, when they do that passion project that isn't necessarily why they got famous. Like, I'm always looking for that piece that's like... No, 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 no. Throw Steve McQueen out. Mm -mm, nope. Can't want it. Don't want it. Nope. Steve, Steve, 12 Years a Slave Steve McQueen or like Bullet uh, Steve McQueen? Uh, uh, 12 Years a Slave Steve McQueen because I have still not gotten over Widows. No, you can keep your passion project at your house. <laughs> like, this is this is a, a an official opinion of the... Uh, I, I mean, I guess I'm going to use you because you're the figurehead. The R.J. Young Brunch Group. Mm. Um, Widows is a good movie and you should watch it. Uh, Widows is a good movie. And you should watch it knowing full well what you're getting into. The bait and switch is not... I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate it one bit. So like your passion I project... No problem marketing. No, no. And usually your passion project is trash. Like just as a rule. Because you're the one... No, I refuse to have your box around me. The only time that I've seen a passion project work out, like in contemporary times, is Jordan Peele would get out. That's it. Because he's actually good at that, right? Because he's also subscribing to the horror genre and all of the themes and all of the responsibilities and all of the plot devices that involve horror. I think you're being unkind to passion projects. I, okay. Especially if you, especially if you've been giving, a, especially if we're talking about directors that have like name brand recognizability. All right, I take that back. My favorite movie is The Passion Project, right? But also, it subscribes to the genre. It's not trying to genre bend. Speaking of which, I want to talk about trash Westworld episodes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, did, were there uh, Passion Projects in those episodes? Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the, 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 the entire second season is a Passion Project. Oh, okay. in the bad way that I that I was just defending. I can't defend that one. <laughs> I just think we need to let ourselves be a lot more open to people that we love failing at something. Yes. Ooh. Absolutely. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, nope. That, that you is see, why... look, she said nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forgive Ridley Scott yes, for Kate. trading too hard. Yes, Kate. My heart was broken. Yes, Kate. I don't think Ridley Scott nope. has a passion project. Every project that really he betrayed me. Is, he made bad things. 
She said, nope. <laughs> I, I get the, I get the kind of stuff. I got to look them up. All right. So Ridley Scott is the dude that has a million things going on at once. And whichever one he's working on is the one he's working on. Like, I'll never forget he made that Jay Getty film in 60 days. Remade the whole damn thing. 60 right. Oh, yeah. Ridley Scott is the reason why movies are really good and also really bad. bad. Yep. Nope. So what, what <laughs> they was look, They look beautiful and are terrible. So... Or, or, or better, like he created the thing that oh, I'm so sick of this. I'm like, yeah, thank Wait, you, uh, Ridley really Scott. Alien, Alien, Pardon? and Blade Runner. Yeah, and uh, there's another one in there that uh, broke the mold. I gotta look it up. Uh, people Those really like Gladiator. So what, then he made so, uh, so, so Prometheus so, and so what, Alien Covenant. So what we cooking? Yeah, what are we cooking? Who's cooking? What's over there? Who's washing their hands? No, Actually, hot good. Mic. Wash your hot hands. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> wash your hands. Public service announcement. What are we cooking? Do a heavy metal voice. Wash your hands. This segment brought to you by soap. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, no. Hey, look. Look, before I watch the latest episode of Westworld, you know what I got? I got a COVID-19 update from HBO. Wait for... That's what I got. Okay. Nah, I, I'm with Kate though. Like, I also think that sometimes you your don't have to forgive anybody for anything. Well, okay, <laughs> you right. can That's hold that grudge. True. I, would say, I like, mean, on top people, of 2020 being the year that we don't apologize, definitely don't have to uh, forgive no. anybody for anything. Is, is 2020 going to apologize to like, us? Make a big deal. It's like, oh yeah, we should forgive this person. You know, like. Nah. I mean, I do kind of low key believe in redemption somewhat, but. <laughs> People should be held accountable for the terrible things they put out into the world. And like the higher up in the world you get, like Ridley Scott, as an example, made it <laughs> <laughs> made amazing films. So like and you know, redefined certain aspects of cinema. And so the damage that he's done is more so than like some, you know, film students, you know, first film that is a fashion project. The sins are not equal. <laughs> how do you, how do you damage? Said sins are not equal. Like, uh, like I would say the Scott brothers. I'm looking at them, at them both right now. I'm just going to name some movies: Alien, Blade Runner, Thelma and Louise, and Gladiator. And I'm a, um, uh, in a slight call out to uh, GI Jane, but for like this is just like before like 1995. Wait, or, wait, wait. Why does slight call out? Uh, because uh, if you do anything with uh, a tough lady that isn't uh, Alien or GI Jane. Um, you you have now created an original movie, something that hasn't been seen before. Yikes! They they have used up they already they have they claimed uh, all the tropes that had to do with strong women doing stuff. Yeah. So you said uh, kinda. Which, oh, what's they, they what's, kinda? The sh what's the shade? Oh no! I'm just, I'm just, I'm sorry that. Uh, Actually, I mean, I guess there's no shade. I guess they're okay. just All straight right. up. Cool. I mean, I'm sorry. To get to the shade, you had to get to the, their latter day stuff. But for the their former day stuff, well, I mean, you, it no, is no shade everybody's of building off of, of that say, particular platform. You had everybody's a, living on that particular pontoon boat. You you had a full throated approval of three movies and then kind of GI Jane. So that's why I asked about GI Jane. Oh no, I uh, I mean I don't think GI Jane is like a particularly great movie. That's all. I mean, but uh, I mean, we could say the same thing about is, Thelma and Louise, absolutely. but. I was about to say it's absolutely in everybody's uh, textbook, but neither is, neither is Gladiator. Like I love Gladiator for because I'm a meathead and I'm me, but it's not a good movie. I was about to say, do you remember any movie that has any sort of like Middle Eastern ethnic wailing in it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thirteenth Warrior. Th th thanks Scott and Hans Zimmer uh, okay. on that one. Uh, let's see, <laughs> man. Uh, they're, they greenly that for the next 20 years. And Frank Miller. Yep. Oh, ugh. Ugh, Frank Miller. <laughs> Can't. Ugh. Frank okay. Miller. All right. Frank so, Miller the writer or Frank Miller the co-opted uh, the co-opted storyline for movies. You get Frank Miller or uh, you get Todd yes. McFarlane to write your movie. Who are you going with? Uh -huh. mm. That's all you get. And you know what? You had you're stuck with Jeb uh Jeb Loeb as the showrunner or uh 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 Stop. Oh uh, God, what's his name? Oh, give me a second. I don't get there. Oh, who couldn't draw? No, wait, no, that was a. Uh... Oh man, I just got done watching this guy's piss poor crap. Who, um, uh, 
Are you talking for comics or for uh, movies? Movies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, what's the show? JJ Abrams. No, he just green lights good stuff. Um, Fair. Oh, you only get Jonah Nolan. You don't get Lisa uh, Lisa Joy. You just get Jonah. Jonathan Jolin. Jonah. Uh, they, Jonah. He, he, Jonathan Nolan is Jonah. His ah, okay. he, his his friends call him Jonah, so I'm gonna call him Jonah. Um, <laughs> That's right, we friends. Right. Okay. Right. Important question here, though. Todd McFarlane from the Spawn cartoon series, or Todd McFarlane from the Spawn movies? Uh, is Todd McFarlane related to Seth McFarlane? He is not, and he would be the first person to tell you that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he would. <laughs> uh, no, Todd, Todd McFarlane, who does live drawings of Spider Man while talking noise to the audience about how easy this is. <laughs> how, how easy it is to draw every single dy dynamic pose in the world right. with texture. I mean, but the guy did invent Venom, right? Yes, he did. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the uh, chunky, the chunky spider webs. But see, this is a perfect example. Like the dude has made three or four iconic things. Like after that, make a bunch of trash. I don't care. So, so you're riding for Kanye on this then? Because he's made, but he's made uh, four but he iconic made things. A lot of trash. What, like yeah. what? Your, what? Like what's your what's your trash album from him? Uh, the gospel album is trash. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. There you go. Um, let me see. M M B T. That's that's masterpiece. College dropout's good. Late night is is not good. It's not trash. It's not good. Um, eight oh eight heartbreaks is, is good. That's that's a masterpiece. That's really yeah. good. <laughs> no, that's that's the best thing he's ever made. And I would say 808 is a heartbreak has changed the game. Like, I mean, unless you're, uh, and his good Friday stuff is good. Here's the thing. I'm in the bag for, uh, oh, uh, 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 uh St. Pablo, uh, 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 the, the Pablo album was bad. Uh, I don't know about that. The first three songs of that album have carried me. <laughs> that's I'm, like, I'm, I'm humming. That's like father, saying, father, stretch your hands and ultralight beam. <sighs> Oh, but that's like no, saying the last point. breath on Creed carries yeah, you. That, I mean, yeah, fair enough. Like that's, that's the only song. It's the only song we're keeping. Everything else is trash. RJ, what I'm hearing you say is, so you only need one. No, that's what you're hearing Ron <laughs> say. That's what you're hearing Ron say. I didn't, like, when you talk, you describe Paul's Boutique, right? I would describe uh, my beautiful, dark, twisted fantasy, or I would describe Southeastern by Jason Isbell, right? The, the album, top to bottom. There is yeah. not a dud. They all slam, and they all slam together as a narrative, right? Because that's the point of putting songs together thematically, right? You're telling a story. The so if you yeah, it's got flow. You said it's got four. Flow. Oh, flow. Yes. So from start, from start to so yeah, not so, a mix. So yes, that's the thing. Like, and I think that also s subscribes to Ron's idea of what he likes, which is put out four songs every couple weeks, and I'll say thank you. Cool. Kanye has not made a bad mixtape. Has he made bad albums? Yes. And one is much more hard, uh, is much more difficult to do. And at the risk of, oh man, uh, got to do this thing again. At the risk of saying this out loud, I tend to believe novels are harder to craft than short stories. And a mixtape is a short story. I think a mixtape is an anthology. An anthology with flow. I, I, was, I was about to say, it's like, it's, it's the shower thought turned into an album. I, I mean, it's well matter. You know, people aren't just putting stuff on there and going, this is what track three will be. It's like, well, how does it come out of track two and go into track four? And I think that has to be respected. But at the same time, it's not being put out there as a long form, usually, right? Also, the idea of a long form, you know, uh, or, I have, I, I don't know what a album length is now because there are people that would tell me eight, there are people that would tell me 22. Right, and if you subscribe to Tech Nine, if it ain't twenty songs on the album, it ain't an album, right? I mean, and I get that. And one like, track I'm, is I'm a seventeen-minute-long story. So, it, right. Like, it, I was say, I, I got a whole bunch of vinyl on the shelf right now. I'm looking at them. Like, I'll be lucky if I have more than nine songs on any one of these albums. Hmm. I want to be conservative about this. I think that if a, if um, a musical story is fifteen minutes or longer, it starts to become long form, and you can you can kind of debate, you know album by album or piece by piece or whatever but there's something about how time is organized over or up up and beyond a certain minimum that i think something new happens you get into a new form of storytelling and i think 
that to me, that's the most conservative definition you can give and be consistent. Mm. Whether it's one track or, you know, a hundred tracks, right? Like there's this Phantomas album called Delirium Cordia. It's a long form. It's one track. It's 70 minutes. It is a headphones album. You lay down there, you put your headphones on, you just listen to it. Oh, yeah. The soundtrack the movie, and the movie happens in your head. One track. Uh, I mean, the closest I can get to that is Eight Mile. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna stand down on that. Y'all got me having my my Spotify open right now, just going through like <laughs> albums right now. The Eight Mile. <laughs> it's like now it's time to browse. Yeah, I'm I'm right now. I'm through the the Isley Brothers drug years. Two important questions about Dark Beautiful Twisted Fantasy. Is it a Kanye album? Or is it the first Kanye Jay Z album by default? Oh, I thought the first Kanye yeah. Jay Z album was the no. I was about to name a uh, a, a Jay Z album. Excuse me, I was about to name a, no R Kelly album. For the what? best of both worlds. <laughs> excuse me, forgive me. Second question is Monster the best Nicki Minaj song featuring Kanye West? Hold up, you say that like there's like a million good. Mick, Nicki Minaj and Kanye songs when there's really only two and Monster's one of them. I'm not implying anything beyond that statement. I I am. <laughs> me, me personally, her verses on that are my favorite verses of hers from anything that she has done. I think it's the best storytelling that I've heard her do. She, happens to be on someone else's project. Well, she she does. And well, that's also uh, not a thing that she wrote. She she was she co-wrote it. She didn't write those, like, she didn't write her verses? She she wrote it with him. Fair enough. Like, no, I mean, seriously, like, they were sitting at the desk together. Like, I I, I know this because I went to read about it. That's why yeah, I'm... Yeah, yeah, Okay, so, like... And I didn't know that. Uh, I, ugh, I, so, like, the accent and whatnot, he, he implored her to do that. She's like, it's, it's getting cheesy now. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like, she, that's what she said. And the most memorable thing on that song is the accent. Matter of fact, you can make an argument the most memorable thing on that album is her on it. I think I agree. That and the cello part, but, you know, that's just because of who I am. But, yeah. Oh, man, that's the other thing. So, like, no bias. Look at this. What, what are we looking at? Cello bias. Oh, Look at all well, this cello bias. Well, yeah, huge. Huge cello bias here. So... What, uh, what do you have against the cello? No, biased for it, not against it. Oh, I was, yeah, sorry, misunderstood. No, you should watch Trolls World Tour. <laughs> it costs money right now, so no, you shouldn't. <laughs> you you should wait for that uh, to get. Don't to, pay money for it. No, don't do that. Mm -mm. It's like, uh, hey RJ, can we watch Trolls World Tour? Is it on Disney Plus? No. All right, well I guess you're gonna wait a couple months. That's how that works. You have to break into a, a closed movie theater to see it. There we go. No, uh, no, we paid uh, we paid enough for uh, the entire brunch group. Uh, and it, it got the money it deserved, so everybody else needs to watch it for free. Uh, fair. Although, Kate, what is it about it? Well, I don't want to give spoilers. I think that uh, given the current circumstances, we we live <laughs> day by day, spoiler by spoiler. Okay. So central to the concept of Trolls 2 World Tour, um, so all of the trolls rep are kind of anthropomorphic representations of different types of music. And it is about their inherent struggle for like dominance. I think I got that from the trailer. And uh, it was better than it should have been. Or I should say deeper than it should have been. That's uh, that's probably the best compliment you can give something. That's true. <laughs> it could it I mean, there's, there's definitely things that could have been better about it. Um, 100%. But they kind of issues they addressed kind of culturally around music and people thinking that their own music is superior as opposed to other people's or like taking, you know, taking from 
other types of music and then kind of saying, oh, this is, you know, profiting off of that. And like, it was all kind of, it was all addressed in that movie. Good. Well, somebody needs to be going out and telling that story. <laughs> all right. Trolls World Tour. Public it to you. Right. Long PS. We are we are getting dangerously close to another half hour, and I thought, all right, so I am going to do a thing where I read these tweets out loud, and then we'll, if you respond, cool. If you don't, also cool. Mina Kimes coming over the top saying, if you want to see two QBs who live on different planets stylistically, Justin Herbert versus Anthony Yolo Gordon week nine is a fun rewatch, to which she gets the sexist response, that's great, can I get extra mayo on my sandwich? She then retweets that response and says, your mom called and said she already made your lunch today and she'd also like you to stop visiting certain websites on the family computer. Is this a, a proportionate response or should she have gone harder? Oh, I mean, it's a pretty soft response for a joke that is the the lamest joke that you could possibly have. People on the internet, stop telling women to make them a sandwich. <laughs> It's Stop! Not funny. Like it's it's, it's like it's bad. it's not. I'm not saying that you should should abuse people or or go out there and harass folks, but be funny if you do. Please, give give me an opportunity to work with the thing that you said. To say that to 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 even reference a sandwich or the kitchen in your tweet to somebody else because you think that you're so smart and humorous. Uh, yeah, go. Um, go do a very drastic thing. I don't, I don't care for it. Uh, be better as, uh, as the first lady would say. I struggle with this one because I, 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 I know that she's, she could have, she could have dropped a, a hammer and she didn't. But I also get that for her to respond to this is also something entirely because now she is one of the luminaries at Espen. And that's really what I, I was, I, it, it really got my attention is because she risked a lot by even responding to this. I think, uh, so I will think she, she did uh, drop the minimum amount of burn for me to, I would have responded with my favorite response, which is the list of burn trauma centers in the United States Wikipedia article. <laughs> Uh, so she she met that minimum bar for me to respond with the burn, but uh, yeah, I mean uh, there there's no there's no there's no maximum that I wouldn't have have accepted. I don't think, or there uh, I can't think of one. Exactly, that, that's because this dropping this joke is an instant death sentence. Mm. <laughs> what whatever she wanted to say, she could have said, and she let this dude off the hook with. Yeah, your, your mom says your lunch is ready. Get out of the basement. And um, she kept and she, she kept respond, it moving. She didn't respond with Dino Fire. But before I say what I'm about to say, um, I just want to say I don't condone the murder of any individual. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Are you uh, <laughs> but I on the internet now, you can't go back on it. Well, I But what I just, if you have a time machine you could kill Hitler? You tell me you wouldn't murder him? I, Is that I, what you're saying? I read about a, I can't remember her name, unfortunately. I read about a 19th century woman who um, murdered her husband um, after he repeatedly told her like she wasn't preparing his meals correctly. Um, <laughs> and she like fed him to like, I think one of his brothers who was also a jerk. Um, so I was just musing on, I wonder if anyone else has ever like snapped and turned their husband into a sandwich. Just oh. curious. <laughs> Sorry. This Probability. got really, ha has to got be really like dark. This, right? uh, <laughs> Guys, it has to be yes, right? Somebody has absolutely turned their terrible husband and or uh, like, close so male relative into a sandwich, right? <laughs> but like, no, it's insane to me. Like, why would you ask somebody you're insulting to make your food like that seems like the most unwise and, and i know that this is not servers all the time i i know that this like tweet isn't like i know that there is actually 
no expectation and he's just being insulting like of food but like it's just such a strange thing to me to for somebody to be like yes go make me a sandwich i mean like, the, yeah i'll make i'll make you a sandwich it's my favorite it's my favorite tool <laughs> I'll line make you into a sandwich i don't know like or there's just so many bad things that could happen like <laughs> for abusing people and then asking them for food anyway sorry so just i don't condone murder, murder. that's what they're asking for is no apologies i'm just i'm just saying no one asked me to uh make them a sandwich <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I guess I would applaud Mina Khan if, if she just said, "Cool, I got you," and like, you know, I'm here. Let's let's make it happen. Uh, just straight up Hannibal the guy, but I think that's <laughs> if if you if you aren't if you don't even feel like putting in the the minimum amount of effort to to walk past the easiest oldest joke in the world, yeah. You deserve to be turned into a Reuben. Well, it's also so weak, too. Like, with the whole, like, you know, like, great opinion, make me a sandwich. is like, you obviously don't have any opinions of your own. Or else you would actually have a good rebuttal. Right. Mina Kimes has been on the air for thousands of hours. There's there's absolutely a thing that you can pull out that is very specific to her. And you decided to do none of that. Not to say that I, I support you sort of harassing people on the internet, but I'm just saying, if you got a, if you got a soundbite, make sure it's good. You got a well, blurb think, in you. I think the saddest thing about it to me is the belief that there is some kind of magic word button that just automatically gives you power over other people instead of just making you sound really desperate when you say stuff like that. Like desperate to live in a time where people could treat people that way. And I just think it's really sad. You know, back, back in my day, people weren't so soft. You could say whatever you wanted. Okay, and now that does it for this uh, episode of the R.J. Young Show podcast. <laughs> Glorious cut. God. Ah. <laughs> uh. RJ, you had an opening to make a sandwich segue, but uh, I guess you didn't take it. No, I'm just going to retitle this Make Me a Sandwich. So that's what I'm oh, gonna, there we go. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to retitle this Make Me a Sandwich. Unless you have another... Because, um, Noam, you're, you're king on that hill. Another form of wordplay to use <clears throat> to, to title episode 159. I'm here for it. Uh... Let me think about it for about 20 seconds. No, nah, hey, look, that's, look. I mean, take I mean, hey, titles on the spot are hard. I can't believe that Archie would do something like that to you. <laughs> that can, can you, can you imagine just being put on the spot in front of tens of viewers? I don't know, Ron. <laughs> uh, how quickly can you make a sandwich? Uh, it depends. Is a hot dog a sandwich? John Hodgman, John Hodgman answered that question on video, and I sent it to the chat. Judge yeah, John Hodgman. There's a there's a whole chart on whether or not yep. uh, things are, are things, whether or not it's a taco <laughs> or a sandwich. You know, you know what? That that's too easy. I I, I violated my rule, own rule. I've sent myself to death. Let me let me let me be let me be more advanced. Is a lobster roll a sandwich? Ooh. Listen, RJ, all I know is that a steak is a salad. So that's all that matters. <laughs> I think you should title this one Above My Pay Grade. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> this philosophy is above my pay grade. Oh, God. Uh, all right. Well, that is Noam. That's Tyler. That's Kate. That's Katie. I'm RJ. Uh, like this channel. Rate, review, subscribe. Uh, we will do brunch next week. And Better smash that notification bell. Oh, speaking be of which, of the, uh, be part of the army. Sh shout out, shout out to the army. Uh, we've surpassed forty thousand subscribers overnight, so that was cool. Hey, that's what's up, buddy. Yep. Not yeah. being a, a power on the internet. Yeah, I don't know about that. Like, you know, the needle drop got like eight million subscribers for talking about. CDs. Out here being the number one indie in the world, he's pretty much the the Smiths of college sports. <laughs> Until they <laughs> it, when when they got college sports. When you got me narrating the opening to Charmed, then we can talk about it. Fair enough. All right. Bye.
Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.